Well, we've had a lot of information and a lot of hard work's gone into preparing that information. I hope you've still got enough energy uh, to listen to yet some more. Um, if that hard work's gone into preparing that, perhaps we can work together now for a few more minutes in studying this very important subject which is on the sheet. And I do hope you have the outline of this message. This is number 12 in a series of Back to Basics. And I'm going to speak to you about justification by faith. Please don't worry if you don't understand those words straight away. But when Paul writes to the Romans, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Well, why aren't you ashamed, Paul? Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed, he says, because the gospel of Christ is God's power. And it saves everyone who believes, Jews first, and also Gentiles, people who aren't Jews. All right, Paul, but what is your gospel about? And he says, for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And what Paul is saying there is that I'm not ashamed of this message. This message is powerful. The Greek word is dynamite. This is the message which saves people who believe. This is the message which shows people how to be right with God. This is the message which shows that you can be right with God through the means of faith. And Paul is actually saying that justification by faith is the gospel. So that's why this subject is so important. It still doesn't matter if you don't understand that, that expression, I'll explain it shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, there are many buildings in Liverpool which claim to be Christian churches. Most of them are not. Martin Luther said that justification by faith is the article of a standing or falling church. If you go into a church you've never visited before, look at the hymns carefully. Listen to the minister as he prays. Listen carefully to the Bible readings which are chosen. There won't be anything wrong with the Bible readings. Listen carefully to the preaching. And however many faults that church has, and it may have hundreds, if it is a church which announces faithfully and clearly justification by faith, it is a Christian church. But if everything is done in the name of Christ but the truth of justification by faith isn't clearly announced it is not a Christian church wherever you find a church which announces justification by faith even though it might have a million faults it is a Christian church but however good a church is in certain areas if it does not proclaim this truth, it is not a Christian church. Because justification by faith, says the Apostle Paul, is the gospel. Now justification by faith answers one question. It's the third sentence on our sheet. How can a guilty sinner like me be righteous before God? It does not answer the question how can a sad person like me be made happy? That's not the gospel. How can a mixed up person like me be put straight? That's not the gospel. How can a person who's got all sorts of things which have got hold of him and won't let go be delivered? That's not the gospel. But how can someone who is guilty, who's broken God's law, who's offended God, who hasn't kept his word, who's rather broken his laws, knowing that this God is holy and pure, how can a person like me be righteous before God, put right with God? Only the message of the Bible which answers that question is the gospel. And any other message, even though it might use the name of Jesus Christ hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, is not the gospel. You'll see tonight I have a few things to say, they're all straightforward. Number one, justification is a declaration. It is something I am said to be. 
It is not something done to me. Please turn in your Bible to Deuteronomy. Chapter 25. Verse 1. Now here are two men who've had a dispute, they've had a quarrel, they can't agree. It comes to court, as is so often the case even today. This is what we read. If there is a dispute between men, and they come to court, that the judges may judge them, and they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked, and then it goes on to tell us what will happen to them. Now let's get the picture. Has this man committed a crime or hasn't he? If the answer is no, the judge says you're innocent. He justifies him. Has the judge made that man innocent? No. All the judge has done is he's declared him to be innocent. That's how the word justify was used in that verse. But of course, if the man is guilty, has the judge made him guilty? No, he's found him to be guilty because he has committed a crime. Therefore, the judge declares him guilty and condemns him. So, one of two things happens in a court. Either you are justified, you're declared to be innocent, or you are condemned. You are declared to be guilty and you are punished. Those are the two opposites. Justification doesn't make anybody innocent, it only declares it. It doesn't make anybody guilty, it only declares it. But justification is declaring someone to be righteous. Saying something. It's something which a man or a woman is said to be. Now that's straightforward when we come to a court, but here is the problem. We are guilty. Romans 3 verse 23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God is holy and just and pure. How can the righteous Lord declare a sinner innocent? How can the holy God declare a sinner to be righteous. That is the problem. And here is the answer. The answer lies in imputation. We're learning a lot of words tonight. So we're now on the second section on the sheet. Justification is a declaration, that's clear, made possible by imputation. Now what does that mean? Well, it's clear, I never written it down. Imputation means that God has reckoned or credited to one person what originally belonged to another person. He's put it to their account. He's laid it to their account. Now, the Bible speaks about Adam and his sin. Were you there when Adam sinned in the garden? No, you weren't. But Adam's sin has been put to your account. It's been imputed to you. Did you actually take the fruit off the tree? No, you didn't. But Adam's sin has been put to your account. Were you guilty that day in the garden? Yes, you were. Because we were in Adam, and Adam's sin has been put to our account. We don't give anything to Adam. We receive from Adam. Adam receives nothing from us. That's called, in the Bible, the imputation of Adam's sin. But that's not our subject. We're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're talking about the people who have been chosen by the Father to belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Here there is a double imputation. There is a mysterious exchange. There is going in two directions. Let's talk about me and my sin. My sin is put to Jesus Christ's account and he is treated as if he had sinned my sin. 
You'll find in the New Testament 2 Corinthians. Please turn there now to one of these key verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. Two Corinthians chapter five verse twenty one For he that is God, for he made him that is the Lord Jesus Christ, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. So here are my lies, and they're put to Jesus Christ's account. Here are all my impure thoughts, they're put on his account. Here's everything that I should have done and haven't and everything I have done and shouldn't it's put to Jesus Christ's account I should be punished for that but it's put to his account and he bears the punishment he's treated as if he had sinned my sin that's why there's no gospel without the cross you see because it was at the cross that he was treated as if he had sinned my sin that's imputation if you stop there you haven't got the gospel that's only half of it and the saddest thing in the British Isles is that the vast majority of evangelical churches preach half a gospel very sad that's only half the story if that was the whole story where would I be? Well, I would be in a position where my sins had been put to his account and punished, but I would still be neutral in God's eyes. God would have no more reason to punish me because the punishment's fallen, but God would certainly have no reason to accept me. So where would I be? There's a mysterious exchange. The other half of the truth is that Jesus Christ, who was born without sin and lived without sin, his perfect life, is put to my account all his purity all his beauty his truthful words his holy thoughts his godly actions everything that God is which has been fleshed out in a human life it's put to my account and the righteousness of God is imputed to the believing sinner. Now let's read 2 Corinthians 5:21 again. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That is the gospel. And so you can see now that it's the life of the Lord Jesus Christ saves us as much as his death does. His life is perfect, otherwise he would have to die of sins for his own. But it's his perfect life which is put to my account. It's like the prodigal son who we read about, when he comes home, the, uh, the best robe is put on him. And now all his filth and wickedness is covered, and the father only sees him in the very best robe. The perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ is put to my account. And God now sees me exactly like he sees his own dear son. And that's why I'm welcomed and accepted and embraced and considered to be dear to God. That is the truth of justification. I am declared to be righteous. I am declared to be just. We come then to our third point. The references in brackets which I haven't read, please read them because they will throw further light on what I'm saying. But I'm keeping really to the basics tonight. Now the third thing I have to tell you is that it's God who justifies. That's what Romans 8.33 says. God declares the sinner to be righteous. He does it freely. It's a gift, says the New Testament. It's the gift of righteousness. We are justified freely, at no cost, by his grace. It's God who justifies. Please turn over the page. Because here we must clear up some misunderstandings. It's not my faith which makes me righteous. 
You see, some people preach and they give the idea that faith is a good work. It's a good work that pleases God. It's something that God accepts instead of obedience. It's something they say that God considers to be just as good as keeping his holy law. And they give the impression that I am saved by my faith. I'm not, you know. Faith is not the ground on which I am accepted by God. God accepts me because there's no reason further to punish me because Jesus Christ died in my place. And he embraces me because Jesus Christ's perfect life has been put to my account. It's the person and the work of Christ which is the ground of righteousness. It's only that. Well, where does faith come in then? Well, faith in and of itself is nothing. You can have faith in Buddha and faith in Muhammad and faith in your next door neighbor. We're talking about faith in Jesus Christ. He is the only sin bearer, he's the only saviour. Faith is the hand which receives this gift of righteousness. It's the means by which God gives me this gift of righteousness and puts and hands it over to me, if you like. It's the instrument by which all this becomes mine in my experience. But it is not the source of that righteousness. So when we say justification by faith, what we mean is justification by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, which we receive by the means of faith. By coming to Jesus Christ and relying upon him and following him. That's what justification by faith is and we must never ever give the impression that faith saves. Jesus Christ saves. It's faith by which salvation becomes yours. So, so many people say are looking to their faith, is my faith strong or weak? They'll be damned like that. You should be looking to Jesus Christ. Just look at him and see and trust him and put your weight upon him. That's faith. But stop looking at yourself and look out to him. That's the way justification comes to us. As we come to the end of this short study, you'll see there are three other important points. Here they are. Number one. Justification is an act. It's complete in a moment. Complete. It's not a process which takes time. What that means is when you come to the Saviour, imputation takes place the moment you believe. The moment you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, at that moment your sins are taken away because of the work of his cross. At that moment righteousness is put to your account it is complete. God doesn't hold against you any more of your sins. God embraces you without any hesitation because of Jesus Christ's life and righteousness which is put to your account. There is nothing more to be done. It is finished. It is complete. You are justified. And you're either justified or you're not. There's no middle ground. There's nobody in the world who's partly justified or on the way to being justified. You're either justified or you're not. And of course, once God's taken away your sins, and once Jesus Christ's righteousness has been put to your account, you can't be unjustified, because God will never go back on what he's done. The Bible says so. So you're right with God. There's no more anger going to fall upon you. There's no condemnation which will be yours. You are justified, says the scripture. Number two. But you're not justified until you repent and believe. Hasn't God planned to save certain people from all eternity? Yes. Didn't Jesus Christ die to take away the sins of those actual people? Yes. Didn't the Holy Spirit covenant to bring those actual people to faith? Yes. But until the Holy Spirit calls you by the gospel, 
and brings you to Christ, until that moment, you are as lost as anybody else. Scripture says so. That's why Galatians 2.16 says, We have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith. Because you're not justified till you believe. If you're not believing tonight, you're not yet justified. But the moment you believe, you will be. That's why Paul often says, you were enemies, you were alienated, you were far off. Because you were. But the very moment you came to Jesus Christ, all those sins were considered to have been punished because Jesus Christ died for you 2,000 years ago. And his perfect life was, is credited to your account, a life which he lived on this earth 2,000 years ago. And you are completely saved the moment you believe. Nothing but the gospel promises that. There are people doing long pilgrimages hoping to be saved. There are people tied up in all sorts of cults tonight hoping to be saved. There are people going to traditional mainline churches hoping to be saved. There are people paying penance and lighting candles and counting rosaries hoping to be saved. And all the time the gospel is saying, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The moment you believe. Number three, no law keeping is necessary. Nobody is saved by keeping the Ten Commandments because nobody has kept the Ten Commandments except our Lord Jesus Christ himself which is why only he can be the saviour. Nobody is saved by law keeping. We're justified by faith alone. Your performance doesn't come into it because Jesus Christ's perfection is what saves you. Keep looking for him. But the faith that justifies, said the old preachers, is never alone. We're justified by faith alone, but the faith that justifies is never alone. What do they mean? It means what the third paragraph says here on the second half of the sheet. Faith is always accompanied by good works. Always. You'll see it there in black print. Because faith without works is dead. And where anybody says they have true faith, but they don't have a life which matches their faith, their faith is a false faith. Those works, those good works, that change in our life which takes place when we believe, those good works don't commend us to God, will never be good enough for him. But those good works are the fruit of our faith. Everybody who God justifies, he sanctifies. That's why the Bible says to Christians that you are washed you are sanctified, you are justified. It says that because everybody who is justified is sanctified. Everybody who is put right with God has a changed heart and a changed character, a changed life, and is on a new road actually becoming more holy. Justification is always accompanied by good works. There are no exceptions to that. Nobody who is a true Christian can live as he used to. And nobody who is a true Christian does live as he used to. At the bottom of our sheet, and as we finish this message, you'll see Galatians 2, 16, quoted word for word. How many times is the word justified found there? How many times does Paul say that we're not justified by the works of the law? That is keeping the Ten Commandments. How many times in that single verse does he tell us that we're saved through the means of faith in Jesus Christ? There is a wonderful summary of the Gospel. It was Paul talking to Peter and he said, this great apostle to this other great apostle, we apostles of Jesus Christ, there is something that we know to be true, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus 
that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the law no flesh shall be justified. Are you justified? Do you know the gospel? Do you know the power of the gospel in your experience and personal life by which you've been put right with God whom you've offended and put right forever and ever because of the life, death, resurrection, person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll sing a hymn.